It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the final Dean Speaker Series event of the year. Thanks for being here. I'm Deborah Castro, and I'm president and CEO of Creative Productions. We're an award-winning marketing and promotions agency. And I'm also a proud USC Price alum. I'm, yes, a USC Price parent. Yep. And, and current member of the Leadership Council for the USC Price Athenian Society. The Athenian Society is the premier philanthropic support group for Saul Price School of Public Policy. Athenian Society members are committed to the mission of the USC Price School, which is to improve the quality of life for people and communities here and abroad. Membership will provide you with access to cutting edge research and scholarship that's taking place at the USC Price School and to a host of networking and professional development opportunities as we are experiencing here tonight. Athenian Society members are also invited to really unique events um, such as this one featuring key leaders who provide insider information on pressing issues and really connecting scholars and policymakers and practitioners alike. And I think that's what really is so unique about Price. On your seats, you'll find membership materials, and you can become a member of the Athenian Society by uh, sponsoring with a minimum gift of $1,500 a year. And I really encourage you to talk to me or any of the other uh, members here tonight that are on the Leadership Council. If you want to raise your hands, that'd be great. As well as the staff here. It's just, it's such a wonderful group, and we would love to have you join us. This year's theme for the Dean Speaker Series events is a fabulous title. It's The Great American City. And tonight's event features a panel of prominent female leaders who work across multiple industries and sectors within Los Angeles. They will discuss the benefits of having female leadership in business, in government, and academia, as well as other critically important fields and they will highlight how our society can promote and increase female leadership within these industries and sectors. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Jack Knott, the Dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy, who holds the C. Irwin and Ione L. Piper Chair. Dean Knott is a leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy, and is currently the president of NASPA, the International Association of Schools of Public Affairs. He is also a member of the National Academy of Public Administration. Under Dean Knott's leadership, the Price School has experienced significant growth. In addition to several major gifts, Dean Knott was instrumental in securing the school's $50 million endowment and naming gift from the Price Family Charitable Fund in November 2011. We are happy to have Dean Knott lead the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy, and we welcome him now to open our evening together. Please join me in welcoming Dean Jack Knott. Thank you very much, Deborah. I really appreciate those comments and uh, your uh, pitch for joining the Athenian Society. Thank you very much. Uh, as Dean, I also want to welcome you on behalf of the Sol Price School of Public Policy to this very special Dean Speaker Series event, uh, which is sponsored by the Athenian Society. And it's really terrific that you can all join us here in the Galen Center in this uh, beautiful room. We're very excited to have a panel representing some of the city's top women leaders uh, who are at the forefront of driving meaningful change uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge two very special people, and that's Kevin and Yvette McCarthy. Uh, Kevin is uh, the chair of our board of counselors and wife, uh, Yvette. Where are you, Kevin? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I certainly would also uh, like to thank our sponsors of tonight's event, uh, Regatta Solutions and Tesoro. Could you please give them a big round of applause? As was mentioned, the theme of the Dean Speaker Series this year is the Great American City. 
Uh, we are trying to explore challenges that cities like LA face, and we hope this dialogue will facilitate our understanding of how to develop more sustainable, more livable, more economically dynamic, and also more equitable and diverse uh, urban areas. Uh, those that have economic growth, but that also have a sense of community. And that's really what we are about here. Uh, within the Sol Price School, it's remarkable the amount of and kinds of expertise that we have focused on cities. Uh, it's in multidisciplinary. It, uh, it ranges from people who are sociologists to economists, urban economists, to urban planners, and so on. And we study things like immigration, social policy, health care, governance, which is very important as well, transportation, nonprofits, employment, and real estate, all of which are central uh, to urban areas and to cities in the United States. And these are the kind of uh, subjects our faculty study every day, and a lot of our alumni work in these areas. We're one of the oldest and highly ranked public policy schools in the country, and we're committed not only to the highest quality research and education, but we're also very committed to making an impact in public policy and in the community. We just don't want to be in the ivory tower. So tonight's conversation addresses the role of women leaders who are difference makers. And the issue is vitally important to our school and is clearly a very relevant and important topic in society today. The conversation will encompass different aspects of our city, such as safety and transportation, the built environment, and quality of life. But unfortunately, in today's world, we see a gap in the composition of leadership in almost all sectors of society. To put it simply, women are underrepresented in these roles, and that really needs to change. As dean, I'm enormously proud of the fact that in our school, four of the six senior leaders in the school are women. They're dynamic innovators uh, whose contributions have really catapulted the school to the level of prominence that it has today. However, this kind of female leadership is not typical of organizations, both at the university or in the United States. In business, female CEOs leading Fortune 1000 companies between 2002 and 2014 produced equity returns that were 226% better than the S&P 500. It's an interesting figure. <laughs> but here's the bad news. On, only 5% of Fortune 1500 companies are headed by women. In government, we see the continued underrepresentation despite the tremendous value that women bring to governing. In the last seven years, statistics show that the average female senator introduced 96 bills versus only 71 bills by the average male senator. Female senators also, and this is important, had more co-sponsors and they more frequently worked across the aisle with members of the opposite party, something we really need in today's world. But despite these important activities, women currently make up just 19% of the House of Representatives and only 20% of the Senate. And even in education, which uh, if you look at our student population, there are more women than men. Only 30% of uh, university presidents are women today. Mm -hmm. So given the importance of women as leaders and change makers, locally, nationally, and internationally, I really look forward to this conversation as we spotlight key issues and talk about approaches to, to promote female leadership across all these critical sectors. So uh, at this juncture, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And our moderator uh, is one of my very favorite female leaders, uh, Bonnie Reese. She's the global director of the USC Schwarzenegger Institute. She's an accomplished attorney, advocate, and public sector strategist. 
Uh, she formerly served as California's Secretary of Education and as a senior advisor under Governor Schwarzenegger. And we have Paula Daniels. Uh, she is the founder of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council and a commissioner of the California Water Commission. Mary Leslie is the president of the Los Angeles Business Council. I do want to mention that uh, Mary is an alumna of the Price School, having earned her master's degree in public policy here. Yes. <laughs> she just mentioned that to me uh, yes. when we were uh, talking. When I hire you, students. Yeah. Deidre Lind <laughs> is the president of the Mayor's Fund for Los Angeles. Uh, Deidre is also a Price graduate, earning a Master's of Public Administration from our school. Thank you. <laughs> and Nuri Martinez is a councilwoman for the city of Los Angeles, representing the 6th District, which encompasses much of the San Fernando Valley. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Jack for the opportunity to moderate this great conversation. And I want to say what an honor it is, not just to run the Schwarzenegger Institute, but to be part of the Public Policy School. Because Jack and the Public Policy School are committed not just to providing the best possible education to all the students so they could grow, they could leave prepared to be our great next generation of leaders. But by picking this topic today as an example, especially when you heard all the statistics Jack went into, of how committed Jack and the Public Policy School is to understanding the importance and value of women leaders in all sectors. So thank you, Jack, and thank you for this opportunity, and thank you all for being here. So there's really two themes of the conversation in the Dean's Speaker Series. One is the Great American City, and the other, because of who the panel participants are today, is women leaders and women in leadership and issues relevant to that. So that'll be the, 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 I know that's the main topic that we want to talk about, but let's start with, because as women leaders, you're great leaders. Women or men, you're great leaders. So let's start before we get to the women as leaders topic. And I'm going to ask each of you, looking ahead 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, and I know it's complex because there are many issues relevant to a great American city, but if each of you, and we'll start down there with you, Paula, could pick one thing, one challenge that you feel LA needs to address for it to, in 5, 10, 20, 25 years, be a great American city, what one area do each of you think that would be? That is a tough one because uh, <laughs> even with a multiple choice, I'd say, could I say all of the above? <laughs> they're, they're, uh, LA is a great city, and I want to say first how thrilled I am to be on the panel, and the timing is important to me because this week I actually started as the executive director of the USC Viragosa Initiative through the Price School of Public Policy, so I'm happy to be part of that family in this effort. And um, the reason I'm in Los Angeles to begin with is because of USC, because I'm also an alum. So I came here to go to school, and I will date myself by saying that I came here in 1973. And I came here sight unseen. This is, I'm going to get to the answer to the question, but okay. I came here. Uh, I know that um, a lot of parents are involved in taking their children to visit colleges before they see them, but I had not seen USC and hadn't really been in Los Angeles. So I was put on a plane, took a taxi for the first time by myself, and arrived at USC in the back of a taxi by myself and saw it for the first time. The thing that struck me about it is what I'm going to talk about, is that it was such a long ride on a freeway <laughs> to here, and I thought, really? This is Los Angeles? <laughs> and in the time that I've been here since, uh, the thing about the city that's really striking is how large it is and how phenomenally wonderful the city is in terms of being connected in a cultural way, but yet we have these places that have developed within the city without us ever getting the chance to bump up against them in the way you might in a more compact city like New York, which has more people, but it's more compact. So even though I have an environmental background and I would want to talk about the environment because I think that's important, even though I know education is important um, very much for the future of our city, I think I'm going to say mobility because we can be often paralyzed by the thing that designed the city, which was the automobile. And we're, there's a lot of work toward helping us be physically together as a community. But I would say mobility from a transportation standpoint, but also I want to use another angle for that word and say mobility in terms of income equality and being able to achieve and maintain a middle class life in this city 
is becoming increasingly complicated, um, particularly because of the affordability mm -hmm. of housing. So in that one word, okay. I want to wrap up those Got ideas. <laughs> did you. I do my multiple choice? You, all yes, no, you did. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm going to take a similar approach as Paula did. I think that this is a city right now that is on the rise. and. I fortunately get to sit in City Hall and hear all of the statistics and the reports about all of the great things that are happening in our city and, and the reports that are coming out like the New York Times this past weekend which talked about the movement of uh, the creative folks from New York City that are coming here to Los Angeles because of our booming creative economy and the increasing number of jobs in, tech, in the technology sector which Mary knows uh, better about than I do but this is really a city that's on the rise and at the same time I think our greatest challenge is the track that parallels all of that great boundless opportunity, which is the fact that we are still the homeless capital, that we ha are rank 98 out of 100 of the most populous cities in terms of our uh, the numbers of youth that are uh, unemployed, um, that in fact one in six youth are actually unemployed right now in this city. Um, that's not anything that's going to get us to 5, 10, 20 years in terms of being that great successful city. So where we can make those bridges happen, and probably because I sit at the cross sector of public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, that's what my job is right now. Um, I think that where we can make those bridges between all of this growth and opportunity and the challenges that we face, transportation as Paula talked about, and all of these other social and, and economic issues that really are butting up against what that success is, where we can make those bridges happen, particularly where we can work successfully cross sector, I think that's what's going to take us to that great American city. Of that's the great. The tale of two cities, so to speak, right? That's right. Mary. I'm not sure it's out of deference for where I'm sitting or you as moderator that the dean just introduced us all, but I'm going to pick education, just okay. one. Because I feel in the end mm -hmm. that education will make or break us. And the reason I feel that way, and, and it has also to do with women, is that now women, as the dean was just saying, are, are disproportionately the largest group entering higher ed, and probably graduate school for that matter. So what is the disconnect between that and being leaders in the broader society? So clearly that's something to look more closely at. But I actually went and looked up the LAUSD numbers this morning, mm -hmm. that, that the graduating class, that 72% roughly were women, and about 61% were men. So that's gonna need to improve, because that's not good enough, right? Now the good news was women, more women are making it through K through 12, but clearly men are having a hard time. So, so this is what I'll, I think will determine our fate, is how well we get it together in, in uh, education here on the public-private side for the city of Los Angeles. Oh, well, I yes. certainly have a passion for that myself. Thank you, yes. Mary. Nuri. You're welcome. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to be here. I represent the Council District 6, which is predominantly in the San Fernando Valley, which is where I grew up. I've always lived in the valley. I live in the community of Sun Valley, which is one of the communities that I represent. And I have to say it's income inequality. Um, in the San Fernando Valley, we used to make things once upon a time. That's why my parents moved there. My mother was a factory worker and my father was a dishwasher when I was growing up. He never drove in his life and would take the bus at 5 in the morning from Pacoima to Sherman Oaks six days out of the week. And when my mom got that factory job that paid $13 an hour, an hour back in the 80s, it transformed my entire life. Uh, it provided, for the very first time, my sister and I health insurance. It was the first time we actually saw a dentist. And so when I talk about income inequality, I'm talking about the majority of the people who live in our city. What does that look like? Um, how are we going to transport people across um, the hill to go wash dishes for minimum wage? Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot support a family of four in this city at $9 an hour. You just cannot do that. And we don't build things in the city anymore. Uh, in the San Fernando Valley, we used to be home to General Motors. We used to actually build cars in this town. My mother used to work at a factory called uh, Price Fister, who used to, uh, it was a plumbing manufacturing company who later got bought out by uh, Black & Decker. And we don't make that anymore. Carnation, the milk, used to be in Van Nuys, which is part of my district. Now it's a high school. That left. Lockheed used to be in Canoga Park. So these big manufacturing jobs that we knew in the 70s, actually back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, that provided good paying jobs for families in the San Fernando Valley. And mind you, we're almost two million people in the valley. 
are all gone. So when we talk about moving this city forward, how do we become a great city, is we have to talk about the income inequality and what does that look like. The majority of the women in this city are single mothers. What is a single mother supposed to do working two full-time jobs, having kids in public school when you talk about education? It's wonderful that we're graduating kids at a higher rate, but can they read and write? And so, you know, and I say this because I have a six-year-old, and so I, this morning I spent a lot of time trying to look, find out where I'm going to send her to school next year. And you want to know what the percentage of kids are reading and writing at proficient level. So all these things are all part of the same issue, is how do we move people, how do we educate kids, and how do we get families out of poverty. And I think it has to do with, and we have to do something about in income inequality and increasing the minimum wage in the city. I have to follow up once, but that, yes. Before, before I move on to women leader and gender issues, there was such commonality amongst what you said. Your mobility dealt with mobility of, of income mobility, and your question, your comment, Deidre, is about the, 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 the youth unemployment. You talked about education, and you talked about the income in, inequality. So my follow-up question is, um, you mentioned minimum wage, but obviously minimum wage alone is not raising minimum wage. Isn't gonna, you, you talk about the loss of manufacturing jobs and good paying jobs. Uh, in a recent study, we see that they looked ahead 10 years at what the job market needs are going to be and the needs of the, the, how many, what percentage of college graduates will be needed and how far short we're going to fall of that. So I know Mary mentioned education. So I just want to hear from the rest of you what are the most important things, briefly, because we want to touch on a lot of things, can we focus on? Does our city need to focus on to make sure that, I mean, even within LAUSD, it's a tale of two cities. We have a high school that wins the academic national decathlon every year, and we have the, among the highest dropout rates in the country. Um, so what do we need to do for the, those that are, are, are at the low end, those living in poverty, and there are far too many. How do we deal with this issue to rise up the single mom that's working at, at, at low wages? What are the most important, uh, specific things? Is, is, it, is it education, K-12, is it higher education, is it vocational education, is it career tech, is it minimum wage? What is it, uh, as you see it, what are the top things no, well, let's start with you on that. Well, I served on the school board for four years, and it was the most gratifying <laughs> part of my career in politics, but also the, the, the most painful. Mm -hmm. LAUSD probably uh, gets about $3,500 a year per student. California remains 48th in the country per pupil spending. So Tennessee and other, other states in the country, New York, for example, is almost at $11,000 per student. So California has a big problem in terms of how we're funding public education. And when we talk about uh, what that formula But I have like, to jump in on no, that, but, Larry, but, on, on LA, to be more specific, because when you say the per pupil, that's across the entire LAUSD. But the problem is, is that when you're, when you're having to maintain a school, a school district that at one point was almost $10 billion budget, and we've already cut it to the bare bones, and you're having to riff more teachers every year because we just can't seem to uh, do with what we have. It's a problem because you're getting rid of teachers. It's teacher seniority. It's you're getting rid of young teachers mm -hmm. who unfortunately don't have the seniority to remain in that school. It's parent education. It's how do you get that mom who has to work two jobs to participate and demand more of their local school. How do you obligate that family to send their kid to a low performing school year after year after year? It's criminal. And she cannot afford to get on a car and leave an hour early to send her to a school in Woodland Hills. That to me is criminal when you actually subject a family to send their kids to a low performing school year after year after year because those parents don't know any better. Right, and, I, and absolutely, and, and those rifts, disproportionately impact, as you and know. And we tried, and we have, we tried, uh, you know, there is a pending lawsuit about how we do layoffs. Who gets hit first is, do we, do we spare the low income, the, the low performing schools? Do we spare them from, from rifting teachers and laying those teachers off? And do we look at layoffs in other schools? I mean, it is, it is a very complicated very formula complicated. and very controversial because unfortunately, 
In public education, the adult agenda gets in the way, mm -hmm. and it rarely is about the students. Right on. Yep. So I, I, I would say I, I run a business organization, and um, it has a mix of um, uh, major real estate owners and um, academic institutions and nonprofits. And it's very diverse, and we have a lot of energy companies. We represent all the sectors that are growing. So when we look at the public policy in Los Angeles, we think about what is going to be good for the common good of Los Angeles, which is a sort of a different business approach than just the proprietary interest of a business. So in that way, I think I'm optimistic, as are you, that, w that our current leadership, our current councilwoman included, and this mayor, and the leadership of uh, the Board of Supervisors, is looking at a more integrated approach, economic development approach, to how, how we're looking at things. Because I completely agree with Nuri. Our group is one of the few that's endorsing the mayor's minimum wage, which might make us the only business group. <laughs> you are. <laughs> and the reason we're OK about that, by the way, is because we see it as a plan with other commitments he's made to reduce the gross receipts tax, so we're not discouraging businesses from coming into Los Angeles and that he has committed to the affordable housing and increasing the housing in Los Angeles, because that's the other issue we have, that we're in the middle of a housing crisis in Los Angeles. We're about a half million units short, and this has been true for quite a while. Combined with the economic development, how we're gonna spur economic development through workforce development and through um, a, you know, a, a good education system. So I think as long as, as, as you can see a broader economic approach on multiple levels, and that there needs to be a big middle that that's the key. The more people we can have look at it that way, that, that all boats need to come up, that, that we're as good as we are as an entire city, that we're not gonna live in little pockets of safety and security, you know, that, that we are part of a broader community. And I think the transit investment, Measure R2, R1, is helping us connect up to our job centers and where we live, because that's the other huge disconnect we had is that where our job centers were and where our affordable housing were, we're not connected, hence why our clogged um, arterials, freeways. Um, so when we get this transit investment in place, if we're able to expedite mm -hmm. it, these are the things that are gonna make a big difference in the city. Deidre and Paula, briefly, so, what, what one, two targeted things can address these income inequality and the percentage of people living in poverty and single moms, et cetera. So we're thinking about this a little bit um, at this nexus where I sit because there's this idea that there are jobs that are available in the city. Um, I heard a statistic recently that we have more engineering jobs here in Los Angeles than are happening even in Silicon Valley. But what's happening is we're importing folks that are trained to take those jobs. And so we are not properly training our local youth to be able to take the jobs of today and tomorrow. And so the ideas that I think about are the career pipeline work, that there's a, a tremendous number of nonprofits and, and local organizations that are doing really wonderful career pipeline work. They're targeting 50 kids here or 20 kids there. Maybe it's 100 kids. They're doing really great work. It's very, very limited in scope. And when you think about the reach of the city and the workforce centers, as Mary talked about, the opportunity we have with the city council and the forward thinking leadership we have there, there's opportunities, I think, to be able to look very specifically at these career pipelines, being able to reach youth when they're still in high school, when they're even in middle school, and being able to work with them, connecting them to the appropriate training to get to those jobs of today and tomorrow. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do have something to add. I mean, those are the, the I, I share those thoughts, and I think as we put, you know, have the fabric of our society work, these are very important infrastructural pieces. But I want to add that I think we need more voter engagement. When we had 21 percent mm -hmm. of the population deciding the mayor's race, I mean, I know there's work to reconcile the voting, you know, times at least, but we need more people participating in the school board races in all the city elections and in every other election that we have. And thinking um, about the role of government and funding and to really think as residents of the city, as voting residents of the city, about what an investment strategy might be in all of these things that need to be supported. Excellent. Um, I'm shifting now to women leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, Nuri, you're the only woman on the city council. Let's, let, I'd like you to start by addressing what, if anything, do women bring to a leadership role that perhaps men don't bring? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think the fact that I'm the only woman on the city council did, just didn't happen overnight. Uh, that being said, women, when we are in these positions, it is really our responsibility to groom other women so that they can then run for our seats. And so part of the problem is that we are not in the pipeline. And so I, I tell women, if you want to run, you need to look six, 12 years down the line because men are very good about this. Men are in that pipeline, and whether there are four or five of them, they're all presidential material. Every single one of them sees themselves in the White House, and I think it's great. I think it's great to have that kind of confidence, but we need to have that too. And if women are serious about running, we have got to not only groom them, prepare them, and financially support them. This is a very emotional career. You know, for us women, we have to decide when we're if we're going to get married one day, if we're going to start a family one day, that all is sort of very different than, a, than my male counterparts in the city council. Some of them are married and have wonderful spouses that just make things happen for them at home. <laughs> we are a little bit different. You know, my daughter is doing her homework with her dad right now, but I'm away and I have to be okay with that. But women bring a completely almost, you know, the difference is any type of issue that you are debating you have to have that other gender lens. Not only, ethnic, I think ethnic-wise, we are diversified on the city council, but the women perspective on the debate on, on minimum wage is huge. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the majority of women that are raising their children by themselves, that's a woman's perspective. When you talk about increasing minimum wage, living wage for hotel workers, where the majority of hotel workers are women in that industry, again, it's the woman perspective. Mm -hmm. When I'm designing a park, for goodness sake, in my community, mm -hmm. What does that look like for the moms to go out and, and take that stroll down the street and on that sidewalk? What does that look like? It's little things like that that I think uh, really change the dynamic of the debate. But also, we have, to role, we have to be role models for our little girls. You know, you cannot be what you cannot see. And I say this over and over again. You cannot be what you cannot see. You have to see women in positions of power and leadership at every single level, whether it's in government, in the private sector. We have got to model for our little girls so that our little girls can call us councilwomen or businesswomen or whatever it is that they're uh, aspiring to be. And women at City Hall are not only running my counterparts' as offices. I have chief of staffs that are women that are very smart. Women are running campaigns. Women are fundraising and getting men elected. There is no reason why more women cannot run in the city and win. Superb. I, I, just, I just have to say something funny based on what you started earlier with the male counterparts and the women, their wives that help them. It's great. Uh, it's a good when, when I was <laughs> when, in the late 70s, when I was in law school, I went to visit this woman law professor, and that was one of my professors. And in her office, there was a big poster that said, behind every successful man is his wife, Absolutely. and behind every successful woman is her shadow. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that was the late 70s. I have, I, I have a wonderful husband, and I love him to death, but it is, uh, it, it, not, not everyone has that same... Um, I mean, I would call myself very lucky and fortunate, but not I, everyone I, does. But, Nori, I think the examples you just shared about through the lens of a woman on, these, on those very real examples, whether it's minimum wage or even just to the design of a park, right. is really illuminating. Um, if, if, Mary, you you're, do work with a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything that women bring to the table as leaders that men don't? I'm going to have to steal a, um, uh, something that a man said about okay. that. Okay, can I do that? I mean, I know that. They steal what women barely do, so go ahead. Right, but <laughs> since he said it, I think I'll just lift it like any good man would. Okay, exactly. fine. Okay. Now, fortunately, he was... He the, wouldn't say he's lifting it from a woman, though. Uh, he might. This guy, <laughs> this guy might, actually, because he was the former president of the United States. Oh, and, okay. and it was Bill Clinton, and it was yeah. at that, that deli um, for one of our friends. And um, literally, he said, you know what's different? You know why it matters? It matters because women are collaborative and they're goal-oriented. And they'll tend to suppress their ego to get to the goal. And they'll tend to work in unusual teams. They're a little less rigid about who gets to play. They're all for, if you're with us, you're with us. We, you know, we're not going to judge what you were before or who you are now. If, you know, so I think Bill Clinton made a good point. That, that true, I, I think he's talking about his wife and other female candidates. And certainly he's had a lot of experience. But I think it's true. I think, I think women tend to be very goal-oriented and very collaborative and they'll do whatever it takes to get it done. 
I mean, do either, do either of you have something else to add on your experiences of what, if anything, women bring to the table of leadership that men don't? I mean, I agree with everything that you both said. Uh, there's an interesting story going back to what Nuri said a minute ago about women running for office. Uh, we have an intern in our office who worked at, at Capitol Hill. And she worked for a female congressperson, a congresswoman, and uh, she was a, the congresswoman was a mo is a mom to young children, and she said that she would often bring her children into the office. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize this, but apparently children are not allowed on the floor of Congress during session. So she would have her kids stand in the hallway while she would run in to do votes because she wanted her kids to see what she was doing. And I think that that is super important. I know my daughter who's 12 says, uh, just said to me the other day, um, daddy drives a cool car, but mom, you have a cool job. And that's, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think it's so great that in, in 20, we've come a long way from when I first entered the workforce as an attorney when there weren't very many women attorneys. I, I was an attorney in another life. Um, and there was um, a lot of resistance to women entering the workforce then. And when you see where we are now, it's really tremendous to see the, the strides that have been made. I think in general, it's uh, important in any democratic society to have leadership that's representative of the various cultures and the diversity of the society. So I think it's important to have women for that reason. And whether we bring certain things or not, I think it depends on the person, right? And I think we are now at a place where we have the ability as women leaders to express ourselves differently and have a range of personalities and skills that we bring, all based on our experience. And yes, there are different experiences we have as a woman that just, you know, it's, it's untranslatable. It's its own culture. And at the same time, we have experiences as Asian Americans. We have experiences as African Americans. So it's important uh, to have those perspectives at the table as well. So for the same reasons that we want ethnic diversity, gender diversity, particularly in parity with representation society is important. But I want to raise a bit of a counterintuitive because I think, you know, if we talk about leadership too, I think that that the way we think about leadership is something for us to consider. Like, what do we expect from our leaders? And in our society, we seem to have expected certain types of behavior. And initially, when women were entering the workforce, it was typing against that behavior that was kind of the question. But whether men should have to be typed to that behavior as well is, I, I think, something to consider. I, and I want to raise a point that I was thinking about as I was thinking about today, that when Obama and Hillary Clinton were running for um, both were candidates and neither had been uh, nominated yet and won the nomination. Uh, Maureen Dowd wrote a piece about Obama being the feminine and Hillary being the masculine candidate. Mm -hmm. But it was because she was describing certain traits that she feminized. Like Obama was more of a listener. He seemed to be, you know, Hillary was a little more aggressive. So she characterized them all. And I thought it was so interesting that she felt it's important to ascribe certain masculine or feminine traits to being a good listener. So I don't necessarily want to genderize being a patient listener. I just want to say somebody's a patient listener and somebody's a team player. So I, I think what we bring are our traits and our experiences that are all invaluable and inform the process. Excellent. Now, I don't, want, I, I, I don't need each of you to answer the following question, but I'm hoping one or more of you might have a story to volunteer about an, any experience in your professional journey where you experienced discrimination I got so many of those. <laughs> no, no, no. no. So but, I don't even want to get one, me started on that. I'm the same age as Anita Hill. All right, but, but what <laughs> so. it was and how you chose to handle it. Uh. Well, I have one. Um, <laughs> it was... Uh, it was interesting. I was uh, about eight months pregnant. So I had my daughter in 2009, two weeks before I won my seat to the LAUSD school board. Perfect timing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that again, uh, run when I'm, while I was pregnant. But um, I remember that one of the um, endorsement meetings and one of the Democratic Party meetings that I actually was invited to interview, one of the women in the back said to me, wouldn't you be better off staying home and raising your family? This is in 2008, um, and it was literally two months before I won in 2009. And I just said to her, and maybe I was 
my husband was in the back, and I can just tell he was like, oh my gosh, she's going to lose it right now. <laughs> the hormones, you know, if you know anything about me, uh, I, I don't react well to that kind of stuff. And so I kind of just very calmly looked at her, and I said, well, how many male candidates have you asked that question of? And I was very proud of myself because I did not lose it. Uh, but it's true. And, and even when I ran for city council, I had women at the door say to me, what is your daughter going to do? How old is your daughter? Uh, or, and then another woman said, well, have you made dinner yet? It's 7 o'clock. And you're walking. It isn't awfully late in the evening. So what's your daughter going to have for dinner? This is like two years ago, mind you. And when I ran for the school board, it was in 2008, 2009. So that kind of, and, and it, this is, and it's not even, it's younger women, it's older women. I felt like it just, for me, it said ma a women's suffrage, like, you know, at least 40, 50 years. I said, my gosh, I have to sit here and really explain. Don't worry, I left the spaghettis made. My husband just had to put it in the microwave. I literally had to say that because she insisted that I go run back and figure out how to feed my family. I go, well, they're, they're fine. Uh, but it, it is that kind of, it worries me that we still have those types. People still kind of sort of think that way. And so when we want to run and we want to conquer, conquer the world and make a difference, and, and sometimes you do spend a lot of time outside of the house, that we're being judged that way. And it's unfortunate. I, I'm glad you brought that up as the example because I want to I challenge something on that. We, we see studies that show that as modern times are still, even where both mom and dad might work, still the main person parenting is still the mom. That hasn't changed dramatically. So with that reality, my question to you is, um, how does that reality, how do, how do women deal with the fact that that's a reality and therefore, even though you're hearing it from one woman in the audience, many women and men, employers, etc., will think that? How do, we, how do you deal with that? What's the response? I actually think maybe what we ought to think about are the institutional structures that put us in that, put women in that position. Mm -hmm. Because there's still not complete parity in terms of um, the economic aspects of having to raise children. And the support for women in this country to be able to do that is different than in other um, advanced nations, is my understanding. The amount of um, the, the child care payment, but also um, guaranteed maternity leave and things like that. So there's a lot of institutional structures that make it the case that that's a choice um, in the United States, whereas in, I think, Italy and some other countries, um, it's set up differently so that women have the opportunity, or men even, have the opportunity to take the time to parent. And they support that financially. So we just, we don't have that here. So the choices keep skewing in that direction. Mary. Plus, yeah, uh, I, I equity. Think, I think, and also, Nuri, kind of, uh, who you choose to associate with as your partner, you know, choose wisely because. <laughs> <laughs> Like some of this, you can tell like right away. You know, you might, you know, if they don't really like that you're succeeding, or uh, that's a hint. maybe that's not the person you should marry. Okay, um, because I do think that I think that pattern gets laid really early. And if if you're already sort of who you are, there, as I like to say to my husband, it was no surprise. Okay, I mean, you know, we dated for five years. Okay, so don't, don't pretend now that you didn't know. But 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 why I'm saying that is because. That is an early choice, and I think you better, you know, you got to be pretty clear. And then I think there's another form of discrimination that's positive, which is the people that will mentor you. Because I think this is the other thing for women. You need good manners. Like, the, like this idea that you go get, you know, highly educated and well-skilled by fine institutions like this one. But later, when you get into the workforce, you should spend a lot of time looking for good manners. Because good manners will, in a way, make or break you. And the other thing about good manners is you better just be willing to do whatever you can for them, you know, it, no matter how mean, menial, you know, d given your many advanced degrees. Um, so what happens then is that I think if you're mentored properly and then you choose wisely and then you keep choosing, and, and the other thing is this flexibility, that, that, that as your life choices change, you better be highly adaptive because 
be prepared to be entrepreneurial. Like I was looking at the entrepreneurial numbers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Do you know that, that, that L.A. Is, has the most amount of women entrepreneurs, second most right. amount of That's women important. entrepreneurs in the United States. And when I worked at SBA, the, 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 by far the largest growth sector of, of entrepreneurs was, were women. And as you know, in Los Angeles, 95% of businesses are small. So, you know, this is something that if you, if you kind of plan right, you know, you could have, you know, how many careers are we going to have? Like seven or how many jobs? Twelve. A lot. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so if you could just work those out to correlate yeah. with whatever stage you're in. No, it's interesting, yeah. Mary, that you brought up the choosing wisely. Yeah. Because as recent with Sheryl Sandberg's husband passing, yeah. Yeah. right, she, uh, and her moving tribute, et cetera, she mm -hmm. talked about how she's always said, uh, the most important decision a woman oh, will tiny. make is who they pick as their yeah. partner, right? Yeah. Um, and she did it in her book, Lean In. So I'm going to yeah. use that as a segue okay, to her concept of lean in, okay? And her belief that too many women aren't leaning in. Uh, as, and I'm, I'm sure that's not true with any of you, but I'm wondering from your, each of your experiences in your road to leadership, um, did you find that you consciously lean in, and have you seen other women in, 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 that you interact with that you're finding aren't? What's your thoughts on the lean in concept for women? So I can take that. Um, I took a, a three-month sabbatical, ultimately. I thought I was going to take a step away from my corporate career um, about a year and a half ago and realized that I wasn't satisfied with it. The issue with the lean in was that I felt like I was judged very quickly. Um, both first when I was working, I felt like there were folks that were judging me. Why aren't I home? Why aren't you making dinner? You know, the same thing. Uh, and then when I took a step away from the workforce, I felt like there were folks judging me as well. So there's all of those kind of dynamics that affect you as a working mom in particular, but just as a working woman. Um, and I think. You know, for me, the issue is that it, there's not parity in how women are judged uh, in terms of this work-life balance as there is with men. And I, I don't know if any of you saw the article in the LA Times over the weekend about Laura Capps, who's the daughter of Lois Capps, who has decided that she's not going to run for that seat. And she said very publicly that she's not going to do it because she has young children and she really wants to be home with her kids. It's not the right time for her to run. Um, coincidentally, the same weekend, and you know, that's her choice. I, I completely respect that. But also this weekend, I learned that there's an assembly member um, who has chosen not to run for the Congress seat because he also wants to stay home with his kids. Now, there was no LA Times article about him. There was only the LA Times article about her. And to me, that's what gets so frustrating is, um, you know, we all need to respect everyone's individual decisions, but then we also have to have equal parity about how we, we look at all of those decisions that are made. Nori, leaning in, what do you think of that concept? <clears throat> well, I don't have a problem leaning in, but I do, uh, in fact, I don't ever recall a time that I haven't ever wanted to be in public office. I think I was in fifth grade when I said I was going to do this for the rest of my life, which is very odd for a fifth grader. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> just worked out that way. But, uh, but I do find that among my friends, who I think are very capable women and who should be running for office, you know, there's a, someone says there's a, that takes an average of seven times before a woman actually decides to do it. So I cannot, uh, I, I don't associate with that because that was never my experience. But it is, it is frustrating to see capable women that can definitely take the leap and run for office and don't do it for whatever reason. You have to respect that. But the one thing I have to say about leaning in, I think women could be better to each other. Uh, <laughs> It is very frustrating. Not only is this an emotionally draining career, because it's very cutthroat, but we don't do enough to support one another. You know, when I lost my, my first time two years ago, my general election by 19 points, it was devastating. I think I cried for a week. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with people seeing that side of me. I'm very comfortable with that. But to be able to get up from that and then turn it around and quickly assemble a campaign and get in a runoff and then win, 
when everybody thought that you were going to basically be walked away from you and then win by 10 points, almost a 30 point swing, is a very difficult thing to do. And now I look, up, I look back and I say, well, I leaned in, I took a chance, mm -hmm. but the amount of people, and I can count them on this, on this hand, that actually were there, mm. other women that were actually there trying to hold me up, it's, it's actually very sad. Mm. And, and I think that we have so many pressures um, in this career that we can do so much better, not only emotionally supporting one another, financially. 80% of my donors are men. I don't have a problem calling people and strangers for money. The men will max out a $700 check. Women have other financial obligations and decide to put the money elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And those $50, $100, whatever you can afford, I always say the coach bag costs probably $400. We can probably... You know, I mean, you know, put a little bit aside and help me out. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, and we'll do a financial plan if we yeah, have yeah, to, just right. installment. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to make that commitment. Right. And I think that once we are in these positions, we are the, probably some of the worst critics are, are, are women. Really, yeah. it, we are. I mean, really I, it's, it's really, part. it's something we have got to own and we have to fix. Because we're then we're going to continue to see the dwindling number of women in, in, in elected offices. When Wendy won, uh, ran, I remember the articles on Wendy Gruel were the color of her lipstick and what she was doing with her hair. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that the LA Times was writing stories on Wendy Gruel letting her hair grow out. I mean, it, it's, really, mm -hmm. it's really that pathetic. And so... Those are the kinds of things that I wish that we can break down and be more honest with each other and support each other um, a little bit more. The mommy guilt is with me every single day. And I can't ever get rid of it. It's just part of what has to be. And I have to believe that my daughter will grow up to be a well-rounded person that will one day say my mommy did the very best job she could. Right on, Mary. Uh, we're gonna open up for questions soon, but before we do, I thought it would be really good if, if as briefly as possible, each of you could share what you think is maybe one of the most important traits each of you has that you believe has led you to be able to have this successful uh, professional career and pathway. Let's start with you, Paul. So I'm going to actually answer the question differently and talk about my mother. <laughs> well, Mother's Day is coming you, up. Because so Mother Day is, Mother's Day is <laughs> coming up. But I want to tell the story of my mother because uh, she's 81 now. And she was a housewife when I was growing up, but she'd always had an interest in politics. Um, she went back to school when I was um, in middle school to finish her college degree, in, um, like when I was 12 or so. Um, and then uh, had her career in special speech pathology. But she ended up becoming an elected official later mm -hmm. on in life. Mm -hmm. And um, she ran for office um, after I got married. I was in my 30s already. I was a partner in a law firm. Mm -hmm. I'd been thinking of my mother in a certain way. And then I saw her suddenly take on the, the uh, challenge of getting into elected office. And she became the head of the National Women's Political Caucus. She was first vice president. She took to it, and it became, I saw her blossom. She continued to have um, a strong role in politics and was one of the most courageous people I know. She was the, the she stood up for the right of uh, same-sex people to marry in 1992, and it ended up affecting her political career. And when she made that vote, she said, you know what? She talked to me about it beforehand. I said, Mom, you got to do it. She said, I've got to do it. This is going to be the end of my career. And it ended up because of where it was in Hawaii in 1992, it did end up um, becoming quite a controversy, but I've never been prouder of, sorry. No, that's I'm getting point. emotional, but because Mother's Day is around the corner, right. I figured I should say that, and I'm glad she's still around, and she kept so, Paul, going on, and the thing I'm gonna the, summarize the, here. The example of your mother was well, a significant factor in your uh, What I wanna say about her is that after that, she went on to be, head the American Cancer Society, and she's continuing to say, I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> she's 81 years old, and oh she's God. still thinking about running for office again. Yay! So <laughs> the reason I'm bringing that up is I'm actually different from her, but I think she is reinventing herself. And she allows herself to reinvent herself. And she allows herself to move her passions forward in the most courageous way all the time. And I think, honestly, that's what I think is one of the best things about LA, to come back to that theme, because we allow ourselves to reinvent ourselves. So, I think so in watching her, I would say I give myself permission 
to reinvent myself. Excellent. <laughs> I want to meet your mom. <laughs> She's coming in a couple weeks. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, I would say for me, back to your question, Bonnie, I think for me, um, what I always come back to over my career, and I've met lots of different people and personalities and all that, but it's being grounded to what, to me, is my value system um, and going back to that idea of being judged and feeling judged over the course of my career and having mentors who I've agreed with uh, and sometimes mentors who I don't always agree with but have, have co coached me in different ways, but just being grounded in what, to me, is important, what, to me, um, makes things work. At, and, and ultimately, it's, it's your gut that gets you through so much of just your daily decisions. No one gives you a guidebook to do these jobs. So um, I, that's what I would say. Being grounded. grounded and trusting your gut. Yeah. Mary. Well, I think, you know, it's an evolution because I think, um, you know, the way you're raised, women are raised. Uh, I, I was in an Italian Catholic family, so, you know, we're, you know, Catholic schools. You know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, you're... A lot of good... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, so there, there's kind of a expectation with that. And then I think what you do is you, you get well educated and then you see that there are choices. And then um, I think the voice inside of you has to sort of evolve. And then, and then you begin to have convictions around some things. And then I think once that happens, teamed with a lot of tenacity, right? And, and, and I would never underestimate the importance of tenacity. Because my experience has been things that are so tough. So conviction paired with tenacity. Oh, for you. conviction paired with tenacity. Because because in the end, do not take on <laughs> anything you know that you're not willing to, to really commit to mm -hmm. for quite a period of time. If you want to if you want to get the outcome you want, right on. You want to win. Yeah. Nori. I have to say my sense of urgency. I have very little patience, and it drives me crazy to be in marathon council meetings. I, sh I shut that down immediately. Um, and to keep hearing the same guy speak for over 20 minutes. I'm so it's a terrible trait sometimes, but I've got to work on the patience. But the reason I say the sense of urgency is because I have an enormous sense of responsibility based on where I grew up, based on the community that I represent, uh, based on the fact that I have the you know, largest amount of landfills in the city of Los Angeles or in my neighborhoods, contaminated toxic sites are in my neighborhoods, lack of uh, you know, open space, unfortunately, do not exist in my neighborhoods. So to me, the sense of urgency comes that I have to deliver on what I say I was going to do. And my staff knows that, and we work really hard, and ultimately we will get ju judged by that. But my neighbors know where I live. They know where to find me. So it's, a sense of urgency it's, it's, paired it's, it's with a... My passion. A, I mean, my, my passion and my call to action is because sometimes passion. my passion gets in, misinterpreted and think that people are, I'm angry. Well, yeah, I'm angry. If you're not <laughs> angry, you're not paying attention. But, uh, but I have got to, yeah, it's just this, 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 this sense of urgency. You Wonderful. know, if I do things well, I'll be on the council for a little while. But nevertheless, it's like it's, like, it's got to be done today. Great. Good afternoon, Brisa Sotelo with Tesoro. Um, I just uh, would like to uh, thank you all for being here today, and I'd like to direct my question to Councilwoman Nuri, who talked about the pipeline of supporting other mm -hmm. women and being mentors. Can you please talk about the mentorship program that you have hosted? I think this is the second year that you will do, and I'd like for you to talk about that so that they know what you are doing in, in council and to support other young ladies that are looking up to you. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you for that, Brisa. But the program that we started last year, it's, it's called Ready for Women. And it's intended to recruit college um, women from throughout. Now it's actually people are applying from throughout the country now. But last year we focused on Los Angeles. And the intent is to get college women who want to run for office, now, who are thinking about it, they want to explore the possibility of running for office, that automatically would disqualify you. Because the whole purpose is for you to actually uh, shadow me and hopefully Carolyn Ramsey, who I expect to win a Council District 4 in the next couple of weeks and join me as a second woman on the City Council, is to really uh, hone in on what it is to be in this career, what it takes to run a campaign, to volunteer in a campaign, the policy decisions or the policy uh, ideas that you want to work on. So they spend all summer with me. And next year, we're going to have, so we keep it to three to four women. 
the four women that we did, um, that went through the program last year, went back to school. They were at US, UCLA and Berkeley and other schools. So it worked out really well. We keep in touch with them. Rocio, which is our other intern, is in Europe. Um, and she's doing very well. She's traveling all over the, uh, all kinds of European countries, and she's probably going to come back. I know she's going to come back and run for office. So that's the intent of the program. It's very basic. But if you're not, if you're thinking of maybe I'm going to run, then that's not going to, this, this isn't it. You, you, you know, have it's, to run. it's interesting about the pipeline because, Jet, when we were putting this together, uh, we talked about while the public policy school has a fabulous network with Athenian and alumni uh, for their undergraduate students and graduate students, we talked about exploring potentially finding women leader alum uh, to pair in a mentorship with undergrad with some of our women students. So we're we're also looking at the at, at the power of that as well. Good evening. My name is Hay Pen with uh, Korean Churches for Community Development. And I think my question has a clearer uh, relevance when there is some nuance in terms of a formal U and an informal U in Spanish as an example. So there's kind of an honorific. Uh, but I think it could still apply even in just the broader American society. So as female, um, when you're in a room and they seem to show deference or respect uh, in terms of language to your colleagues who are male, in the room and yet somehow seem to discriminate uh, towards you, I am wondering how do you advise or how have you maneuvered in a way to send out the message that you didn't appreciate it or to gain their respect but in a way that's positive? Just recently I was in a meeting where it was pretty uh, apparent that there was a man in the room who was talking to the other men in the room and there were two of us women and probably six men and they were kind of talking amongst themselves and we were sort of sitting there and we had sort of experienced that once before in this similar meeting. And um, uh, my colleague and I, uh, who also is a woman, were sort of, we, we had, after this first meeting, we were sort of frustrated. So when the second meeting happened, I, I will say I called him out, actually. And I said, you know, there's others of us in the room who have something that we'd like to say when you're ready to hear, we'd really like to join in the conversation. And so I think so, they, they sort of laughed, I think, because they were a little bit uncomfortable. It was a small setting, so it, I, we, I felt empowered to do it, but I think the more that we can call out when those situations happen, and I don't think we as women do that enough when we see those situations happen, but I, um, where you feel empowered to call it out, I think it just helps those folks to maybe recognize what they're doing. Maybe they didn't even realize it. Liz Smith, excuse me. In my journey in life, one of the things I've experienced is that strong, confident women have difficulty with being labeled as aggressive versus assertive. And I just want to open it up to the panel to <laughs> ask you, how do you handle that distinction? Because I know, personally, I've had that challenge, and I know other strong women who have had that challenge, where they've been mislabeled. Nori, I'm I sure get labeled a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't care anymore. I, I mean, I think <laughs> that's just really, it's just the truth. I mean, you either get to know me, we get to work on great projects, and we become best friends at the end of the day. Uh, it, it just, uh, after hearing, you know, you know, why aren't you at home raising your child? You're too passionate, which turns into you look angry all the time. People used to say you should smile more, for goodness sakes. I mean, what else should I do? Uh, you know, at, at some point, you just sort of, for me personally, I've just given up on all that. And it's really about the work and, um, and, and delivering. So I've got to deliver. My, my focus in my career is to deliver for my constituents, whether it's with a smile or frown or whatever it is. Uh, when I get that street repaved, they're not going to care if it was mm. aggressive or, <laughs> or assertive. It got done. And so that, for me, I've, I've given up on that. And I used to. I, it used to make me feel bad that people would interpret me as, you know, uh, intimidating or, you know, oh, gosh, you look like you're so intense all the time. Yeah, because there's like a hundred things going on in my mind. Not personal, but 
you know, that, that's just my personality. So I've, I've kind of given up on that. I'm guessing that most of you are going to say that at a certain point, you're all going to focus like Nuri on just getting the job done sure. and not letting yourself get distracted by what people yeah, might label you. Yeah, I guess you. the one thing I will say is that, um, I mean, I was a civil litigator, so I was in a pretty intense setting and I had lots of battles. So believe me, you know, I've been called a lot and I called back. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was the arena. I, I think the thing that, um, I guess to get to Hapen's question as well, to keep in mind is that no one can make you feel bad without your permission. Mm -hmm. So that's an Eleanor Roosevelt quote, and I'm yep. choosing her deliberately because we're talking about women leaders. Um, and I think that is just, you just know who you are, and that's about the end of the discussion. And Paula, <laughs> that's the perfect quote for us to end this discussion on. Thank you all so very much.